Um, so today's topic what we're going to discuss about is uh, faith and um, the negativity and some positivity that comes with it and how we can learn a lesson from it for me personally as well it's an important question um, and I would really like the advice of both of the brothers of how they deal with it in their own fields so yeah today's topic is fame and <laughs> the brother of the Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, that was a beautiful response. I didn't, get, I didn't get that. That's because you're not that famous. <laughs> uh, may Allah forgive us. That's actually a very good way of starting. Uh, Brother Ali was just telling me what we're going to be talking about. And MashaAllah, it is a very, very big challenge. It is a double edged sword. Fame is a double edged sword. And it's also a fitna. It's also a very big test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, while you need to rise to the occasion when you need to fulfill some duties and obligations that Allah has placed on your shoulders, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is the excitement of the people and where you allow it to take you. If you let the fact that so many people have benefited from you, I'm talking about myself, brother Moeen, uh, I'm one of his fans, so that's fine. We'll talk about him a bit later, inshallah. Uh, I told him as we were walking in, I said, you go in, you do the batting, I'll do the fielding. So he says, okay, mashallah. So sometimes when you have uh, people whom you may have benefited in some way, I need to keep reminding myself that it's not me, it's Allah. This work can be taken from anyone else. This work can be taken away from me and it can be given to someone or it can be shared with other people. I need to be very happy for everyone else doing the same work. That's something I always try to do. And this because subhanallah, I have mentors and I have my father as well keeps me in check all the time. And he keeps reminding me to say, you know what? you better make sure that you realize that you're just a human being and I am and I don't think those who know me my closed circle when I say closed circle I mean let's say close circle okay would actually confirm that I try my best to be myself but then people start uh, wanting to for example take photos with you it's a problem everyone wants to take a photo a selfie and it becomes an issue because if you take one people say this guy's a celebrity sheikh, by the way. And if you don't take one, this guy's arrogant. Look at him. He doesn't even want to acknowledge these children. I mean, I had a child moments ago come to me with a beautiful gift, whatever it was. And he was explaining to me and I said, you know what? I love you so much. You don't need to give me something. I really love you. It's not that you need to give me. No, but I want to. And imagine if everyone had to come with something. I would need to fly on my own plane to go back home. So by default, it's not wrong to give away what someone has given you. Uh, although some people say you're not allowed to give it away. You cannot impose that on me. But you don't need to give something to someone. Also, what I've learned over time is you have to try to explain to people and talk to them and tell them that look, this is the reality. I have a platform of speaking to people. So I say it last night, I was speaking at some masjid. And I remember reading a WhatsApp message, someone forwarded me to say one of the biggest scholars of our time. And I started my talk by saying, Astaghfirullah, I need to clear it. I'm not one of the biggest of the time. I am actually a nothing and a nobody to be honest with you. Allah's used us to share a few words with people. And therefore, we will share those words. And praise Allah and make dua for me. And that's it. We don't have to. I know people might say, but I'm so happy to see you. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. But even if you did not see me, your chances of entering Jannah are still the same. You know, it doesn't mean you saw me. So now suddenly uh, the angel will say, hang on, hang on. Did you see Mufti Meng? Yes. Okay. You got to come on this side here. Did you take a selfie with him? Okay. Okay. The temperature of your grave is going to be two degrees lower. It doesn't happen. So I, I've tried to remind people. 
uh, in this regard, and I know people get irritated with me as well. The reason why they get irritated, and I'm sure it might be happening with Brother Mu'in and so many others, because you don't realize, or the people sometimes don't realize, with a very good heart, they want a piece of you. So you get 20 messages initially, then it becomes 200, then it becomes 2,000, and honestly, it becomes a few thousand. If I were to add up all my messages that I get every single day, uh, I actually cannot put a figure. It goes well beyond 20,000. Well beyond 20,000. That's if I count Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and email, all the different emails and platforms, as well as my phone, WhatsApp, the phone calls, it's everything put together. It's a crazy amount. So what do I do? I have to make dua. Ya Allah, whoever has emailed me, with any difficulty, you help them. Because I also have to turn to Allah. I might not be able to respond to you, but I have to turn to Allah. I cannot be a person who, you know, wants to uh, claim that for myself. Okay, okay, I can't manage, I can't cope. And even if I were to respond, I have to still refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, you, you have to be careful. A person like me has to be careful. You don't develop wings. You know, you don't develop horns, as my mother says. Don't develop horns, which means don't start becoming an animal, thinking that I'm a big deal and that's it. Allah can drop you straight away. And you despise people, you look at them and yeah, by the way, talk to those who are uh, the least, who would expect it, the least that you spoke to them. I've actually sometimes gone to visit people uh, based on something very random sometimes and they would be shocked. But that's it, the idea is Number one, idkhalu sururi fi qalbi mu'min. To to put happiness into the heart of a believer is an act of worship. So it's for making that happen. And number two, it's to show them, you know what? We're just human beings. You might see me. Yes, I'll be traveling. I'll be walking here. It's it would probably be me. Me. People come to me sometimes at at a mall, at an airport. Uh, are you? If they say, do you know Mufti Menk? And I say, I know him. It's true, I know him. Uh, and then some say. Are you Mufti Menk? I say, why, why do I look like him? So you try to like sort of brush it off and then sometimes you can't run away. You know, they say, yeah, it is you and so on. But let's remember one thing and I'm going to hand over back to you because I can talk, you know. Uh, let's remember one thing that Allah, we owe it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Human beings, we respect them. It stops at that respect. When it comes to the relationship, people say to me, I turned because of you. Hang on, reword it. I turned because of Allah. And He used you to do a little bit of that work. Alhamdulillah. So we just got to word it correctly. I try my best. And if I go wrong, slap me. No problem. You can slap me. I give you the permission to do that, inshallah. Habibi. Okay, may Allah bless you. Um, before I get into it, obviously, well, uh, Mufti Menk, um, you're around Muslims and it's mainly, you know, your Dawahs to non Muslims as well. Me personally, I'm, sometimes I'm out there giving dawah, speak to non-Muslims. But Brother Mo and Ali, you work with non-Muslims. You know, that's a really d different thing. I have a couple of friends, non-Muslims as well, but I don't really like, because you said you spend a lot of time. Like, um, so how is it for you, um, you know, being around um, non-Muslims? And how do you give them dawah? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's quite difficult sometimes, you know, it's... Um, um, I, I sort of remind myself the reason why I'm playing and um, the reason why I'm out here playing for England and, and doing what I do. And I have a few ways of, to, uh, to remind myself. And the main one is to first of all to tell myself that um, one day I will die and all this will finish. And um, you know that really keeps me grounded. And a lot of the time when I'm traveling, I and I'm on a plane and I look down and I think you know you can see a lot of people, a lot of buildings, and you, you see little little. You know, you can barely see uh, people and I, I tell myself that actually what I'm doing is in, on a personal point, it's, um, this, it's worth nothing, you know. We're really actually little, little human beings and, and things like that. So that keeps me grounded as much as I can and I try and, um, you know, be the best I can, especially with the non-Muslims. I, I try and um, implement the manners that I need to implement. And that doesn't mean, you know, you've got to be all serious and... Um, you know, you've you got to have a laugh and joke with the guys and, you know, try and do everything as much as you can with them. Obviously, when they do their haram things, then we, we, don't, uh, we don't do that. But a lot of the time, it's about, um, you know, just having that, that sort of banter with them and, 
and, and being, being almost real with them. I think if you be yourself with them, then um, they will respect you a lot more and um, explain, you know, you don't have to explain things as much as everybody else. Do you, has, I, I don't know what happened there, but maybe it was me, I'll take the blame. Um, has any of them ever come to you and said, like, asked you about Islam? Have they ever wanted to fast with you? Have they tried to? Um, like, I'm sure you get these questions. Yeah, lots, uh, many times, you know, especially, um, you know, if, if a couple of us are doing our salah and things, you know, they ask us uh, why we do our salah, for example, and, and, and obviously during the month of Ramadan at the moment, we're playing in England and they, they always ask, you know, how do you do it and things like that. But alhamdulillah, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a way for us to explain, you know, about giving charity, about being good and, and you know, the reasons behind why we fast. And uh, we've had one player who wanted to fast with us one day and, you know, he got up for Sehri with us and, and I told him, you know, um, you won't be able to do it. And he asked me why. He's, if you can do it, then why can't I do it? And I said to him, because the reason why we do it is because we do it for Allah and it's Ramadan and the, the reasons behind it. And he, he said to me, no, no, I'll be able to do it, no problem. So he got up and um, he, he did a sahri and we had a tough training session that day. And I remember he came to me at lunchtime and he obviously smelt the, the, the chips and the, and the baked beans and things like that. And he goes, look, I, I can't do it anymore. And I said to him, look, I told you, you can't do it. And he, and he goes, why couldn't I do it? And I said, because the reason you're doing it is to prove to yourself and prove to me that you can, you can fast and um, that is a complete, almost different reason for why we do it. And, um, you know, we do this a lot, you know, a lot of the guys, they always ask about the Arabic and, and you know, when they hear the Adhan in, in UAE and things like that. So, you know, it's, for me, it's a perfect opportunity to, to give my little sort of da'wah. And I don't really go up to them as much. I wait for them to come to me a lot of the time. Well, mashallah. And one thing I just want to highlight before I ask the second question is uh, how important we, we, we sometimes think dawa is opening a stall in the middle of the city. It's not, that's not it. A lot of people think, okay, brother Ali, how can I get involved in dawa? And I'm thinking, why, what makes you think dawa is just going out there? One of the biggest forms of dawa that I believe I give to, gave to my own father, and uh, obviously may Allah keep me humble, and I'm not, not saying uh, that I've done anything special, but my dad hated Islam. And every time when he would open that TV and see a terrorist attack, he would just say, hey, that's you and your friends, you know? That's what he would say to me, you know? And one of the ways that I've dealt with that is not talk, well, give that with verbally as well, but actions. Your actions speak louder. Wallahi by Allah, your actions speak louder because people look at your manners and they're thinking, what makes this person so beautiful in character? I want to know the one he worships. And this is really crucial that we forget. Um, I just wanted to give you guys as that reminder, but now coming back to uh, our main topic. Um, now there's a lot of brothers out there, obviously they deal with charity work and they do a lot of things. Now sometimes they're in this dilemma where they're thinking, I don't want to get involved, I don't want popularity. So what that does is the shaitan works in a way where he abstains from doing good because he's thinking, if I do it then I'm going to be known or people are going to think I'm doing it for this reason. Because sometimes I have a brother who's another YouTuber, he will tell me sometimes he's like, I'm around brothers and I would want to help them. But then shaitan makes him think like, oh, you're trying to be humble. But then if I don't, then okay, uh, they're going to be thinking, oh, he's arrogant. He just thinks he's... So how does one deal with that, you know, to have that balance where it doesn't go to one extreme of doing nothing and not the other extreme of doing it all for fame? I think a good Muslim should always question his or her intentions and keep questioning to say, am I doing it for the right reason? But the idea of questioning should not be to block it or stop it, rather to correct the intention and to keep it right. So the shaitan will definitely keep coming and making you think, uh, think to yourself that perhaps I'm trying to show this humility and so on. But you need to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem and still do what is right. You see, that's the beauty. So we are taught to seek the protection in Allah from shaitan the accursed and do what's right. So Allah didn't say that you stop what doing what's right, but you seek Allah's protection and keep yourself humble in that way. So I think with myself as well, uh, if, if the fame has come, wallahi, I haven't asked for it. I did not promote myself, but it came without me expecting it. Those of you who know my upbringing and who know where I've started, you would probably be amazed that how did this happen? I don't know myself, but I've just maintained consistency in the sense that I try not to attack people. 
I try to present the da'wah in a positive way and I try to give value to all the people, no matter who they are. They must feel valuable. If I see a little child, this little boy right in front of me taking a picture, for example, I mean, he's as good as my own son. I, I cannot get upset with him. What are you doing here? Get out. No, I know you can sit there. Don't worry. You can take another picture. Perhaps I can teach you something. You can turn around, put your face facing the other way, and you can actually have a selfie from where you're sitting. Did you hear what I said? Yes. So what I mean is why should I chase him? I can actually uh, relate to them. And this just is because of myself. And it's because I'm constantly concerned about the people around me to make sure that I don't develop this feeling within me. And then when I do this, sometimes before it was a bit more, now it's less. Shaitan used to come and say, hey, what are you trying to prove? You want to just prove your point. And I think that's what you're saying. Well, you have to constantly say, no, I'm not trying to prove a point. I'm doing that which is right. And I'm actually going to do this because it is correct. And through that, you end up touching the lives of so many people because trust me, there's a lot of hopelessness out there. There's a lot of, you know, chaos out there. People are looking for hope. People are looking for someone who can relate to them. People are looking for someone who can tell them that don't worry, the mercy of Allah is very near to you rather than someone who's just blasting them day in day out when I first graduated that's what I used to do I used to get up when I listen to some of my older lectures I feel so so you know there's a cringe I want to delete them because I tell myself was that really you just telling everyone you're going to hell basically and as you develop and you grow you soften up and you realize I'm softening because I I am now in the real world I was an idealistic before now you're a realist you have to face the facts you have to understand the world is changing how are you going to face the challenges without compromising your deen and how are you going to guide others because they want guidance we all love Allah even the brothers who are committing sins the sisters who may be committing sins I'm sure deep down they claim to love Allah and I'm sure that love is there so all you got to do is kindle it and if you're going to allow shaitan to come to you and make you think that I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to be doing this because I might become famous, then you fell in the trap of the devil exactly where he wants you to be. So like I said right at the beginning, double edged sword. May Allah make it easy for all of us. My advice to you all keep on doing good work, no matter what it is. But be aware that shaitan may come to you in different ways. Seek the protection in Allah from shaitan the accursed and keep on doing what is right. Wallahu a'lam. Thank you, may Allah bless you. Um, I'm going to discuss two topics um, which I see that there's a trouble uh, in the ummah. Um, you, you kind of touched up on it, but it's a reminder you gave us yesterday, if you remember, uh, when we were speaking. Young, zealous brothers, you know, they, they obviously come to the religion and um, you come full force and sometimes they want to go do good and I have no doubt most of them they have this correct intention of doing things the right way but however the harshness uh, the manners are really lacking and unfortunately I speak to a lot of brothers as well who are known in the YouTube as well where they say my non-Muslim friends come to me and say is this what you part with like is this what you go through like you just made for example one mistake on YouTube and then you got this many attacks like what advice would you give, uh, and this question both of you, uh, to these young brothers? How can they calm down a bit and understand that, yes, they're trying to enjoy good and forbid evil, but there is a time and a place to do that thing at the right time. So what kind of advice would you give to the youth, both sisters and brothers out there? Um, I think from, like I'm not in that much of a position, I don't really uh, know that much about that, but for me, it's... Um, the, the manners and the character is so important, especially in front of the non-Muslims that, you know, they, even though you don't realize, sometimes they look at everything you do, um, even the way you dress or, um, you know, the way you talk and, you know, it's so important from, from a Muslim point of view that you, when you talk to the non-Muslims that, or when you're even around, if you're walking out the room that there's a, there's a sort of demeanor and um, if you really, you know, want to sh show them the sunnah and, and, you know, things like that, then a lot of the time, I know Islam tells us this anyway, but you have to be on your best behavior most of the time, um, you know, even away from um, when you're on your own and things like that. So, uh, you know, it, a lot of the guys, they, they look at us. Um, there's a few of us Muslim players now in the side, alhamdulillah, and when they look at us, we know that they are, 
um, not judging us, but they're just checking us out to see what, what kind of people we are really and things. And you know, over time, now, alhamdulillah, they, they trust us. And um, you know, like I said earlier, we get involved with the, with the jokes and, and things like that. Um, and in most cases, we get involved with them. Um, and they enjoy, enjoy the company and a lot of them will come up to us and we didn't realize, you know, uh, Muslims were, you know, a, a quite a good laugh at times and um, I'm not saying like, I'm a great laugh, but I know, I know a lot of the guys um, enjoy, you know, our company and, and things like that. And you spend so much time with them that you have to um, be on your best behavior as much as you can. I think if I can add that I appreciate what Moeen has said because uh, he probably gets a lot of flack from the Muslims themselves. And what I want to say, look, we're living in an environment that is not an Islamic environment. You need to understand you're living in a multicultural, uh, multi-religious country. And you're just one of the so many that exist. You need to fulfill the rights of everyone out there. And the problem is we tend to forget that there are different types of people. We need to talk to them in a positive way. Go back to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He always encouraged people. It was so positive. It was such a beautiful encouragement. There was a time when some people came to his house. They found out about his acts of worship and they decided that they want to act or they want to fulfill acts of worship just like that. And so they became strict on themselves. And the Prophet ﷺ heard about how one says, I'm not going to eat meat. The other one says, I'm not going to touch my wife. The other one says, I'm going to fast and so on. And when he addressed the situation, he said, you know, you know, what is it with people who say this and that? He didn't say, this man, come here. That man, you're doomed. This one here, you are like this. It's a weakness we have. He did not have that. We have this weakness because if there were more than those three, they would all benefit from this common term that's being used. But if, if they were... If we had to use the one term, we would actually ignore the fact that so many others would benefit. And if we were to say names, a lot of the times people become hard to say, what, what did this guy say about me? I'm going to fix him. I'm going to show him. So your intention needs to be right. Knowledge, and this is a controversial statement. Knowledge comes with a lot of arrogance, just like money. Did you hear what I said? If you don't check it, you can be the most arrogant person ever because you know, you know, and you know that you know you, that you know. So you look at someone and say, ah, by the way, what do these guys know? Nothing. They're not even Muslims. That's how it ended. Because why? That was the knowledge you had, arrogance. But when true knowledge humbles you, when you practice according to it and you understand, I know of a certain brother, he was hard. He used to call people names and take them out of the fold and so on and so forth. Allah tested him with his own children leaving the fold of Islam. And then I happened to chat with him and I told him, brother, you're so hard. And so he said, I've learned my lesson. I was pointing at everyone else and Allah tested me in my own home. So this is the challenge. This is what Allah probably uh, made him go through this to realize that he's being too hard on everyone else. The Quran says to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi Allah says, You know, if you were hard, harsh, hard hearted, and you had to be hard in your wording and in the way you uh, dealt with them, they would have dispersed from around you. They would disperse. So this goes to show today we need uh, a lot of convincing. You need to talk to people. It's no longer like a long time ago. We used to say, fulfill your salah. They say, okay, okay, Allahu Akbar. No, no, it's no longer like that. Now, fulfill your salah. You can expect the child to say, why? What do I have in it? That's what's happening. You can't just slap them like I told you to slap me. No, we still belong to the previous generation. We will accept a slap, but they won't. They won't. So this is why we need to be humble. I believe there is great damage. When people become a little bit popular and they use that popularity to attack rather than to build. Remember this. I mean, look at what's happening across the world at the moment. We're struggling because people prefer to destroy rather than to build. And, and they justify it no matter what. And I always say, people say, what about these killings? I say, we are against all killings, no matter who is perpetrating them. It's dangerous. It's detrimental. We prefer to build, to resolve the matter, to solve it. I'd rather sit with you. I'd rather try to do things. And people say, no ways. You don't know what you're talking about. Be consistent. Continue in the right path. Don't lose hope when you know, be focused. And like I was telling you yesterday and a few of the brothers who we were talking to, 
Today, it's become very difficult to remain on the moderate path. It's very easy because we are being bombarded from two extremes to actually fall. When you're doing something right and you're on the moderate path, when I say moderate path, I don't mean you've given up your deen. No, I mean the way you treat others and the way you carry yourself, the way you look at others, how you want to present the deen to them. So there are people who bash and they tell you you're so wrong until you bash. You've got to bash just like we do. And if you just remain focused, ignore, ignore, ignore. It's so difficult to be on this middle path. Because on the other hand, there are people who will also call you names while you're on the middle path to sway you that way. And my advice, neither sway this way nor that way. Remain on the path, remain focused, keep on giving people this hope and inshallah you will see the result by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at these faces, look at these beautiful people. Why do you think they're here? All of them are here to be inspired, to get a good word, to feel like Allah loves them as they walk out of here, to feel good. Imagine if we had to come here and make them feel like they were already going to hell, subhanallah. You know, you guys doomed, that's it. Every one of you, watch out, you're going to go. To, how, why should I even say that? I prefer, especially in this world, to choose the prophetic method of giving people hope. And yes, there is a time when warnings do come through. If you notice, sometimes when I word, when I word it, I see who I'm talking to. And I say, brothers and sisters, those who do good will go to paradise. And then when I see who I'm talking to, a group of youngsters and so on, and I say, and those who don't, they will go elsewhere. You heard me say that? What does elsewhere refer to here, guys? Can someone say it? Wow, did you hear the little, a small young boy, mashallah, saying it refers to hellfire. Did I say hellfire? I didn't. He understood what I said. There we are. We got it in a beautiful way, but we hit it exactly where it's supposed to be. I don't need to say, burn, hellfire, you know, skin, it's gonna, it's there. But hang on, there is a place and a time to say it that way. First, you need to win the people. You need to understand that the people are, you know, what is keeping them on the dean? As a famous person or anyone who's popular, it's easy for you to sit behind a screen, to sit behind a camera. No one knows what exactly you go through in your life. And you're just bombarding everybody. You don't know what they're going through in their lives. I tell you one thing, brother Ali, my travels across the globe have softened me in a big way because I've seen people from different walks of life trying to please Allah. And I've realized those who haven't traveled and seen and, you know, witnessed what everyone is doing. Sometimes they don't appreciate the circumstances surrounding the person's, you know, life. And they start saying statements that are very, very hurtful. So if you choose beautiful words, inshallah, you will be able to touch people in a much, much better way. Uh, may Allah forgive me for taking so long to respond. May Allah bless you for that answer, both of you. Um, this topic, uh, finally, I think we've got some time for this, inshallah. Um, it was a topic that I wanted to discuss today anyway, um, but I received <clears throat> a message from a sister, and she said, um, obviously, she was getting to know this brother for marriage. Everything was going well until the family found out that she is a divorced sister. Now, this is a big, big problem within the Ummah. Sisters who are divorced are being looked up, down upon, like, I'm not even going to mention uh, anything, in a very disgusting way. And they're human beings, and we get these messages, and the sisters saying, what am I supposed to do? I got married, it didn't work out, Qadr of Allah. But what am I going to do? I'm being rejected. Just because I'm divorced, they, they actually, uh, they said, look, we don't want to know you. They totally cut off the sister just because she's divorced. If you can give us, obviously, answer, inshallah, and give us example of the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how the Sahaba uh, married divorced sisters, etc. If you can really tackle this issue, please. Brother Ali, you've actually touched a chord. The reason is, I don't need to give you an example of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's companions. Can, you, can you guys hear us? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. I okay. I don't need to give you an example of the companions when I can talk about the Prophet Sallallahu himself and I hope the families will be listening to this and like I say we haven't mentioned names so the benefit will be to thousands of people and before I say this sometimes when I tweet or when I write something when I put up a post on Facebook and so on people say it's like you knew what I was going through. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I'm just being a real human being. That's all. I know what I'm going through. That's what it is. And I know what a few people are going through. So everyone goes through similar things because we're all human beings. You have a house, you eat a few times a day, you go out, you earn, etc., etc. Let's get back to what you were saying. 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm addressing those who treat divorced women badly or those who look down upon them or those who don't want to marry them just because they are divorced. Who did he marry? Himself. Number one, the woman he chose and he agreed to marry and he had his children with and he loved and he continued to say even after she passed away that you know what I miss her and he used to be kind to her relatives even after she passed away was Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha she was divorced she was married before there are narrations that actually make mention of two men that she was married to one after the other and some say one that's besides the point but what's confirmed is she was not a virgin so to speak she was married before the Prophet ﷺ agreed. She was much older. The Prophet ﷺ agreed. Subhanallah. Why would he do that? Thereafter, all his wives were either widows or divorced. All of them, besides Aisha radiallahu anha, the only one. Why? I think that answers the question. The ignorance of these people regarding their own Prophet, the one whom they declare their entry into Islam with in terms of the statement ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu they don't even know who is that muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they haven't even they probably know he was married to so and so but they've never paused to think about it may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all those who are divorced to marry again don't give up don't give up there are some good guys out there inshallah quite a few of them i see them here this afternoon mashallah and uh, the other way as well, if you've had a bad experience, my brothers, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You can get up and inshallah, you can get married by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, we make dua that those who are not married at all, you know, you might be thinking you've forgotten us. No, we haven't. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist you and guide you. Uh, the point we're raising here is don't judge people. Don't think they were bad just because they're divorced. And one more thing, when they're divorced, you are bound to hear rumors we live in an age of whatsapp have you come across that if you live in the age of whatsapp you can imagine what's happening all, all day and all, all night people are just saying things and they they just uh, you know forwarding anything and everything we love gossip let's be honest we love it we we actually cause the spreading of gossip just by forwarding messages this is why I said in a, f a few days ago when I was speaking somewhere else that you know what you need to do? Delete the message and reply the person to say, please don't send me this type of gossip again. But you are bound to hear bad things because everyone wants to prove a point. I've seen a few people who are so good that after the divorce, when you ask them what went wrong, they say that was between me and her. And you know what? She's the mother of my children. I don't want to say anything bad. It's okay. She's lo a lovely person and we didn't get along. Wallahi. That man or that woman deserves the mercy of Allah because they are being merciful upon someone else. So be careful when you've been through a divorce. And I know now it's about 60% of marriages end up in divorce. That's the statistic that I last read. And in, in the Maldives, they said it was 90%. May Allah forgive us. But uh, I do know that's happening. Be careful. Don't try and prove who was right and wrong. That's it. Leave it. And if you really need to tell someone because you're now getting married again, people say, can I ask you what went wrong? You have the right to remain silent and to say, listen, trust me or it's okay. I don't need to marry you. Or you want to say, you know what? Really this went wrong and that went wrong. The sad reality is things would actually become even worse. May Allah forgive us. I'm so sorry to take so long to answer. Uh, uh, I want to thank you bo uh, both of you. May Allah grant you both of you Jannah, inshallah. Uh, and hope you guys have benefited inshallah. Um, yeah, that's about it, inshallah. Our time is up. Uh, the brother keeps pointing at us. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to just close an up statement just quickly, inshallah? Um, from my point of view, I think, um, like I just, I, I tell myself this, I'm not really told anyone, but I'm actually a very average uh, player um, when it comes to cricket, but I know it's the, the dua of the people that, you know, sometimes I, I see it. And so the other people that really keeps me going and um, you know when when I do do well it's it's through those du'as and um, please keep making du'a for me uh, I know people think it's a luxury lifestyle but it's not as easy as, as it looks 
Jazakallah khair, barakallah fiqh. I think he's an awesome player, mashallah. Barakallah fiqh. May Allah bless you. Iqra' kitab Allah tarq jinanahu wa tanal azim al-ajri wal-ghufran.